I'm Dr. Marianne Armbruster. I'm an advanced master gardener with the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners Association. Welcome to Get Growing, our horticulture lecture series, which is a collaboration between the Lafayette Parish Library and the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners. Herbs were originally collected in the wild for food, medicine, fiber, and oil. Of course, people were restricted to what grew near them because most people didn't travel very far from home. But for the few people who did travel, they brought back plants with them, plants, seeds, etc. These were then taken into cultivation when people settled down and stopped being nomadic. The earliest herb gardens were documented at about 4,000 years ago in Egypt. Herbs and spices were responsible for both exploration and wars, because at times certain spices were worth more than gold. The early Christian monasteries grew everything that they needed. They also distilled their own liqueurs, many of which became identified with the monasteries, such as Benedictine. But some are also known today as things like Campari or the Vermouths. These gardens were walled gardens because it protected them from the animals. It took advantage of shade because most of these were in southern Europe or northern Africa where it was very dry. And also it made best use of water in that dry climate. 16th century universities had huge herb gardens and they used them to teach both botany and medicine. The colonial era saw movement around the world. But when people moved, they took their important plants and seeds with them. After that, it was trial and error to see which ones would survive in the area that they moved to. Herbs make a world of difference to food. Regional cuisine is actually characterized by the herbs used to flavor staple foods. So before we go any further, I want to differentiate herbs, spices, and flavorings because they're not the same. Herbs are aromatic, leafy parts of a plant. Spices are any part that's not a leaf. For instance, cloves are flower buds. Ginger is a root. Cinnamon is a bark, etc. Now, I'm not going to list all of these, but you can look at them on the slides. Some plants provide both herbs and spices. Dill and fennel leaves are herbs, while their seeds are spices. But sometimes we change the name when the use is changed. Cilantro is the herb, but its seed is called coriander. Then there are flavorings. These are foods that are used to add flavor to other foods. Things like onions, citrus, garlic, horseradish. Some particular fragrant mixtures characterize regional fare. A bouquet garni says France. Garam masala, northern India. Mint is prominent in Middle Eastern food. Five spice powder almost defines Chinese and Vietnamese food. And cilantro and peppers characterize Mexican fare. Color often makes food more appetizing. Green, you can make with chopped parsley or chives, yellow with saffron or turmeric, and red with annatto or paprika. Now, annatto is a pepper, but it does not contain capsaicin, so it can be used in large quantities, providing color with no heat. It's actually very mild. Here are some fairly well-known greens. Italian pesto, North African charmoula, or French sauce verte. All of these are green sauces. You want a red? Go for South American sazon. A yellow? Think curry powder. And this here is one of the many, maybe 10,000 possible curry recipes available. Herbs have many benefits. They increase the vitamin and mineral content of food. They can improve digestion. For instance, peppermint has a soothing, mildly anesthetic effect on the digestive tract. Bitter elements in herbs prime the digestion by stimulating the liver and gallbladder to help digest fats. Essential oils in plants are keys to both flavor and the beneficial effects of herbs and spices. Many are strongly antiseptic, and that was very important before the era of preservation, refrigeration that we have now. Herbs were used in the past as a means of both keeping the food from going bad too quickly 
and disguising the slightly off rancid taste that it might get. Fennel, dill, and caraway are carminative oils. They can reduce flatulence from foods that are hard to digest. Garlic is a gastric disinfectant. It's worth taking while traveling to avoid bouts of upset. You always want to use the freshest possible herbs so you can grow your own, as we'll discuss in a little bit. Or you can buy spices whole and grind them as needed. That's your best way if you have to buy them. If you have to buy them pre-ground, buy them in very, very small quantities or buy them in larger quantities and freeze them. Now, if you're going to freeze them, you have to remember a couple of things. One is you have to bring the, the container to room temperature before opening it or all the condensation that's on the outside will also get on the spice and ruin it. And it's okay to refreeze things like spices. These are not meat, so it isn't a problem. Add herbs towards the end or after cooking. Or you can add herbs twice early on to get a melded depth of flavor and again at the end to give that pop a fresh herb flavor. Now when you walk into a room and smell that wonderful smell while you're cooking, just remember all of that smell is actually the volatile oils going up into the air rather than into the food. So cook with covers or add volatile things later. Garlic, spices, and tough herbs like bay leaf, for instance, can be added early. You can also add herbs and spices to vinegars, oils, or mustards to subtly flavor dressings and marinades. Herb vinegar or oil will keep up to a year, allowing the flavors to permeate beautifully. It's a great way to use strong flavored herbs like lavender that are, say, hard to add directly, especially to like a salad. Perk up salads by adding arugula, dandelion, nasturtium leaves, or sorrel. You can also add edible flowers. These make a beautiful salad and add an interesting pop of flavor. Nasturtiums, dianthus, violets, chive flowers, and garlic chive flowers are all edible. So, alliums, the onions and their relatives. You have the scallions, which are also known as green onions or clumping onions, or locally we kind of tend to refer to them as shallots, but they aren't. Then there are chives and garlic chives. True garlic, leeks, real shallots, elephant garlic, and ramps. So how do you grow onions, leeks, at all? You need a rich, well-drained soil and full sun. You plant seeds around here, 20th of September to the 15th of October. Plant them about an eighth of an inch deep and space them two to four inches. For anything where you want to grow a bulb, spacing is going to define the size of your bulb. The greater the spacing, the larger the resultant bulb. Days to harvest is going to be 135 to 210, depending on the variety. You can plant sets mid-December to the end of January. Now, sets are those little bitty bulbs that you see in the stores around that time of year. You want to plant that bulb one inch deep with the pointy side up, and those have 120 to 150 days to harvest. And again, wider spacing is going to yield larger bulbs. Basils, and there are many of them. You need a rich, light, well-drained to dry soil in full sun. This is a Mediterranean plant. They don't like temperatures much below 50 degrees. Frost will definitely kill them. Sort of acidic pH to slightly alkaline. Sow the seeds in the spring. You can pinch the plants to both delay flowering, harvest some of the leaves to use, and promote bushiness because that's going to give you more leaves to harvest. You can harvest the whole plant as flowering begins and dry it. Just hang it upside down and dry it because once the flowers are on the plant, the taste of the leaves is not as good anymore. Not terrible bad, but just not as fine as it could be. And they will definitely die at first frost. So if you have any plants left at that point and a frost is predicted, just pull them in and dry them. There are many, many choices for basil cultivars. If you like pesto, you want the big leafed kind like Genovese, Italian large leaf or lettuce leaf. There are flavored basils like anise, lemon or cinnamon. And then there are the ones that are sort of common in Thai food like holy basil, opal basil, blue spice, or Thai basil. To grow cilantro and coriander, 
Of course, that's the plant, leaf, and the seed. You need well-drained soil and full sun. Now, this plant prefers a cool, damp spring followed by a hot, dry summer. So you might want to choose your location very carefully. Maybe something that's protected from our torrential rains and allowing you to water it in an appropriate manner. Sow the seeds in the spring or the summer. Now they will tend to bolt, that is go to seed, if they're too dry at the seedling stage or during the summer, they just don't like to be too dry. They like to be dry, but not too dry. Now figure that out. You can gather the leaves and the stem tips when they're young, and of course that's cilantro. Then you can let the plant go to seed and then harvest the seeds when they're dry and ripe, meaning brown. You can use them whole or you can grind them, and then that's the spice coriander. Many of us like to use cumin, and it's pretty easy to grow. You need a well-drained soil in full sun, and sow the seeds in the spring. Just collect the seeds when they're ripe and store them whole. And again, you can grind them for culinary use as needed. Turmeric. Turmeric's really hot right now. I mean, you hear turmeric everywhere. It's wonderful for you because it contains all sorts of antioxidants and flavonoids. But it's an essential flavor in curries and some other cuisines. But it needs a well-drained soil, full sun, and a humid climate. Guess what? It likes it here. Doesn't like it much below 50, 59 degrees, though. So if your temperatures are going to go down really cold, you might want to lift the dormant rhizomes. You can steam or boil them, then grind, dry and grind them. They can be propagated by seed sown in the fall or divided, ri divide the rhizomes when they're dormant. Now, honestly, I have never seen turmeric seeds for sale anywhere, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. I just haven't seen any but it's pretty easy to do, deal with the rhizomes. Now, it says 59 degrees, but mine are, are acting like perennials. They just go dormant when it gets that cold, and then they come back when it gets warm again. So I don't lift mine, but that's me. Lemongrass, necessary if you like Thai food. You need well-drained soil in full sun. They don't like it below 45 degrees, so you'll have to cover them or grow them in a greenhouse. You can propagate them by division in the spring. The base of the leaf is used fresh. Now remember, if you're gonna grow lemongrass, this is a large plant. It can take up 16 to 20 square feet when it's mature. It's big. Bay, for bay leaves. This is a shrub or a small tree, and I kind of mean small. Mine's six or seven years old, and it's only about two and a half feet high. But then again, I had one when I lived in France that was maybe eight feet tall, but it was a 200-year-old house, so Lord knows how old that tree was. It needs well-drained soil and sun. It's easy to grow in containers. You can propagate it from semi-ripe cuttings or by removing suckers in the summer or by layering in the fall. You can collect the leaves in the summer and dry them. They actually have better flavor when they're dried. During the drying process, enzymes work on the contents of the leaf and actually improve the flavors for us. However, do use your dried leaves within a year because they'll begin to lose flavor after that. Cardamom. Now, first I said I wasn't going to put this in here because I said and I've never seen cardamom seeds for sale. But guess what? They are very available. So rich, moist, well-drained soil in partial shade, minimum 64 degrees. They definitely don't like cold, just like me. Propagate by seed in the fall or by division in the spring or summer. You can collect the seeds, which is what you want, during the dry season. Dry them whole, and then you can use them f to flavor bakery products, coffee, curries, pickles, milk-based desserts, fruit composts, and mulled wine. Fennel. Very easy to grow. If you've ever grown dill, you know how to grow fennel. Well-drained, rich, light, moist soil in full sun. It's not hardy in areas with cold, damp winters. You want to sow the seeds in fall or spring, and you can propagate by division in the spring. However, this plant self-seeds very freely, so unless you go to the trouble of preventing the seeds from falling to the ground, you'll have plenty of fennel after the first year. The flowers attract a number of beneficial insects. Do not grow dill near fennel. They will hybridize and the seeds will not taste right. You can harvest the leaves anytime, but you do want the seeds to be ripe. 
So if you want the seeds, you need to cut the seed heads, turn them into a paper bag so that they will fall down in there. You can also, when the seeds begin to form on the plant, you can put a paper bag over the whole thing and tie it down and then wait for the seeds to ripen and fall naturally, And then, but you'll collect them in that paper bag. It works very well. And then you can use those seeds whole or ground. Helichrysum italicum, the curry plant. My first thought was not to include this because I've never seen a curry plant. Then I realized that helichrysum is also called everlastings and a lot of people grow everlastings. You just didn't know you could eat them. The sprigs of the plant may be added to rice, vegetables, deviled eggs, and other savory dishes. It gives a mild curry flavor. It needs a light, well-drained soil and sun. You can plant the seeds in the spring in a light, rich soil. Barely cover them, like a one-eighth of an inch at most. Or you can plant the, put it in a pot. It does not like cold. You want to maintain steady moisture. It also doesn't like drought. Move it to a warmer area when the temperatures drop. You can propagate by semi-ripe cuttings in the summer and cut it back to old wood in the spring. So you've got a nice perennial on your hands there once you've planted it and gotten it started. Lovage. Lovage is a nice celery substitute. Celery is really difficult to grow, so lovage makes a nice change. Deep, rich, moist soil in sun or partial shade. Propagate by seed sown in the fall or division in the spring. Pick the leaves before flowering and dry them. You can collect the shoots and leaves for fresh use as well. The young shoots can be blanched and used as a vegetable. If you collect the seeds, they can be added to breads and cheese crackers. The leaves are used in soups, stews, salads, and other savory dishes. Mints. The only thing I'm going to tell you about growing mints, since it's so easy, is most mints are invasive. Either plant them in pots or in an area that is well separated from anything else you're interested in with lots of lawn to mow, and uh, you might be safe but pots are the safest. Marjoram and oregano. There are two kinds of oregano, Italian and Greek, and then there's sweet marjoram. They are similar in flavor, but not identical. You can propagate them by seed sown in the fall or by cuttings and non-flowering shoots in the early summer. Harvest the leaves and shoots as needed for fresh use. Harvest the whole plant and dry it when flowering begins because again once the flowering starts the flavor is not as good as it needs to be. Now you've got Italian oregano which likes well-drained soil neutral to alkaline and is normally frost hardy. You can use it fresh or dried and it's good in tomato and cheese based dishes. You can substitute Italian oregano for marjoram. Greek oregano may be substituted for either marjoram or Italian oregano but the flavor is inferior. Sweet marjoram is more delicate than the oregano, and it's best added fresh towards the end of cooking. The leaves and flowering sprigs are used in Italian and Greek cuisine. They're good in meat dishes, soups, tomato sauces, and pastas, or to flavor oils and vinegars. Parsley. Now, that's something we use a lot of here. Rich, well-drained soil, neutral to alkaline, sun or part shade. So seeds in the early spring, early summer, and fall. It takes three to six weeks to germinate. You may speed up the germination somewhat by soaking the seeds in hot water before planting. If you're gonna grow it, grow flat leaf parsley, Italian parsley, not the curly variety. For one, it has a better flavor. For a second, the curly variety makes great hidey places for, for critters. If you are gonna grow the curly variety, once you've harvested it, I suggest you take it inside, make a bowl of salt water, and swish the plant through that salt water. It'll make all the critters fall off. Then you'll be safe. But I'd just rather use the flat leaf to start with. Now, parsley is a biennial. It's like carrots. It takes two years to produce seeds. So you'll see growth the first year. It's very vegetative, lots of what you want when you're looking for parsley. Then it'll kind of die down a little bit. Those will go away, and a different kind of leaf will come up. It's, there's fewer of them. They still have the same flavor. You can use them just fine, but eventually you're going to see a, a flower stalk come up. And when the flower stalk comes up, then stop collecting because the flavor's not going to be so great anymore. But that's when you would collect your seeds if you want to have seeds. Collect the whole plant when it's full for drying.
that's all for today. Don't forget to check both the library and the Master Gardener webpages and Facebook pages to see what we're going to be doing in the future.